NASDAQ came along. NASDAQ was promoted as an automated quotation system only in the beginning. And we didn't know whether we should be a part of NASDAQ or not. At the 11th hour, after weeks of discussion, we said, well, okay, let's do it. And if we don't like it, we can always drop out. So we get on NASDAQ, and at that time, we were trading reorganization, bankruptcy reorganization stocks, one trader's specialty. So a stock listed on the exchange was halted by the SEC. It had to leave the exchange, and people needed to make transactions. We listed that stock on NASDAQ, and instantly our phone, the phones on the desk were all lit up, and we, we were getting calls from all over the country. And we realized, yes, NASDAQ has made us given us the opportunity to become a national trading organization. And we just kept going on that. We did more and more and more whenever we could. We picked up stocks, and we tried to find competent traders, and that was good fun. We realized, of course, you know, there, was, there were new ideas about how to do business every day, and Buzzy and I were able to form a very meaningful partnership. We made a couple of decisions very early which were very important. We decided that we would not have arguments as partners. Although we disagreed on many, many issues, but we agreed that if one of us said, you know, yes, we could make some money doing that, but I just don't like the business. It doesn't feel right. I don't want to do it. Okay, we said we're not going to do it. We never had an argument in our 35 years of being partners in the same firm. That was wonderful. The other decision that we made was that we decided to rely on each other's integrity. We did not want to go home with problems that would keep us from sleeping. We wanted to know that we could rely on everyone's honesty. That became a hallmark of the firm we did our business that way, and we continued to do that until the deal was done with Merrill Lynch, and when all the papers were signed and we knew that it was complete, one of the lawyers came to me and he said, you know, John, this is, we've bought many firms in Merrill Lynch's existence. This is the first time we have bought a firm without any compliance problems. I thought that was great. And that's, that's what we did. We were known that way. We, we started out with four trades a day. When we got to Merrill Lynch, we had 750 employees. And we were making 450,000 trades each day. Unbelievable. I thought that was a story worth telling. Most of those trades, some 90-odd percent of those trades were all computer matched. We didn't have to do anything. However, that left 30, 40, 50,000 trades each day that we had to put through our operations department. And I learned, I didn't know this until very recently, someone who knew about the book told me, oh yeah, when Herzog would deliver something and we had a question, we would do what Herzog said because we thought they were so great. 
And that was a wonderful compliment. We were very proud of our operations, and we loved our employees. We did everything we could to keep our employees happy. When business was crummy and we needed to cut expenses, we said, you each have one day off a week, but we don't want you to go and get another job. You stay here. And when business got better, we made it up to them over and over. I'm on the subway now, 17 years after this deal closed, and a guy will walk up to me <laughs> and say to me, Mr. Herzog, I know you, but you don't know me. I worked for you. And I can tell you there's no other place out there that was, that's like the way it used to be. So this was a wonderful experience for all of us. We had so much fun. And each day was a challenge. And that was a wonderful thing to do. We kept asking one another, what business are we in? If we couldn't answer that question properly, we got out of this business that we had thought we'd try. We tried trading listed options as a hedge for our positions in the common stocks. That did not work. We realized that we had twice the exposure because we could not act rapidly enough to take care of the options and the stocks. So we dropped all the options. And that's why finding out and asking yourself constantly, what business are you in, was so very valuable. We, we tried to innovate on behalf of doing things that were more fun and more productive. And we tried to let our customers have some fun at the same time. There's a table over there with a lot of things that the firm created, advertisements and stuff. And we, we uh, had wonderful results with that. I met our advertising guy, Warren Lee, on the street one day, and he said to me, John, you know, Merrill Lynch has a bull, and Oppenheimer has a lion. You should have a tiger. And I looked at him, I said, you know, Warren, are you nuts or what? I said, I made a mistake. Come to the executive committee, and make a presentation. So he came along with some images, and the executive committee loved it. And I found out at that moment that Buzzy had always loved the big cats. So we adopted the tiger. And the tiger appears in our advertisements, and the tiger is telling the bull and the bear in one of the ads, we know which way we're going, follow me. <laughs> and it was wonderful, people loved it, they got a little laugh out of it and we were very happy and so were they. We, we saw so many changes and the 20th century in our, in our nation witnessed the most dramatic changes to the capital markets probably ever anywhere. So uh, there was the crash of 1929 and then the SEC and then self-regulatory organizations and then the uh, fixed commissions went away on May 1st, 1975, that had a tremendous effect on the marketplace. And the form of the firms themselves changed dramatically from partnerships to corporations. When Ira Haupt went bankrupt, 
in, I think, 1968. Ira Haupt was a big partnership, nationwide firm, very important. And my mother knew the wife of one of the partners. She called her up. And this woman said, Norma, I still have my toothbrush. And that's the way it was. If you were a partner in a firm, everything went away to the people that you owed money to. In a corporation, you had your stock, and that was not within the reach of the legal folks. And so, the decision making went from the partners who had the capital invested to the executives who happened to be the president or the vice president of the firm. That was a tremendous change in the manner of the industry. And it's one which we are feeling today we don't know about it all the time, but we are feeling that way. And many, many of these issues that I am mentioning are reasons why I wanted to establish this museum. I knew from my industry experience going to meetings that the American public did not know anything about finance. That's a shame. How many people in this room know what the capital markets are? Well, there are a lot of hands not raised. So I'm thinking that you don't know what the capital markets are. The stock market, the bond market, and the commodities market, which enable people through trading mechanisms to transfer large amounts of money easily and seamlessly. Our capital markets in America have been the best in the world for a very long time, ever really, ever since Hamilton designed them. And the loss of that leadership in the capital markets is a very serious problem for us all to face. I wanted to enhance the understanding of the American public of the capital markets. I wanted people to come here and see stuff and think, hey, you know, why am I voting for this guy when he's against that? That is a good thing. And I am hopeful that the museum has had a positive influence in these areas. I'm praying because in America, there is no finance without politics and vice versa, as we are learning so painfully by reading the newspaper every morning. When will the news improve? I wish I could tell you. We, we, along the way, let's see, how, how am I doing for time, okay? Uh, along the way, because we operated with integrity, we were shocked when there was an announcement many years ago that there had been a $100 million fine for insider trading. My God, what could the guy have been trading to make a one? That was years ago. Only recently, Steve Cohen from SAC Capital was fined $1.8 billion for insider trading abuses. Is that activity something that we as Americans want to have continued? Does it make sense that Congress is thinking about rescinding the regulations that went into effect after 2008-9? 
And how can we prevent these things from happening? The trading business is a business of risk. And people who take risks think, I have the right answer. I am going to make a lot of money. That's what Nick Leeson thought when he was in Singapore and he was one of the star traders of bearings. And he and the people in London were thrilled. That firm was the Queen's brokerage firm. Uh, Robert Morris did business with them in the Revolutionary and the Federal Period of America. Wonderful firm. Leeson said, no, I, I have I, I can make a lot of money on this. And he took the errors that began to appear in his trading account, and he put them in an error account, which was not subject to the same strict oversight as his trading account got in London. And then he thought, well, I was just a mistake last week. I'm going to fix that with this new risk. But it got worse. Finally, there was a big number in that error account that nobody knew anything about. And he said, OK, here's, here's how I'm going to reverse all this at once. He bet that the Tokyo Stock Exchange would not decline significantly on the night of February 26th, 1995. If you look at your history books, you will see that that is the very night that the Kobe earthquake occurred. And when the market opened in the following day, it was way down. He put bearings out of business in one day. Bearings committed the unpardonable crime of having a trader also be in charge of operations. Oh my goodness. And if you want to be in a risk business, you have to learn how to understand risk and then speak to that risk, to reduce it, to refine it, to make sure that the risk will not catch you while you are asleep. So we had a lot of fun thinking about these issues, trying to refine our risks all the time. And, of course, we made plenty of mistakes, but we ended up okay.